back, everybody. We, Cirque has been on uh, has about a month break, but we're back. Uh, not in, in, the, in the largest premises at City U, but uh, so far so good. We can fit everybody here. Um, we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Philip Hirsch, uh, from, uh, who's an emeritus professor of human geography and School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. Uh, before I say anything more about Philip's background, it's worth pointing out that he just mentioned to, uh, to Tom and me that they have about 300 members now of the Southeast Asia. Is that Southeast Asia Center? Southeast Asia Center. We have about 30. <laughs> so we're flying, feeling slightly, uh, slightly smaller these days. But um, no, Sydney has is, uh, is, got a, an extraordinary strength in Southeast Asian studies. And that's, of course, good to see uh, in these days, particularly as Southeast Asia programs in other places uh, have, uh, have, have lost staff rather than have so many. Um, Philip is, as I said, Emeritus Professor at Sydney. He's published extensively on the environment, development, and agrarian change in Southeast Asia, having carried out extensive field work in Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia for a period of more than three decades. And I think that's very admirable to have covered so many Southeast Asian countries. Another issue about our region, as people tend to focus, obviously, given language and cultural differences on one country, you've covered so many. That's, uh, that's admirable. Your recent books include uh, with Derek Hall and Tanya Lee, The Powers of Exclusion, Land Dilemmas in Southeast Asia, uh, a book, The Mekong, a Socio-Legal Approach to River Basin Development, that was <coughs> in 2016, and the Routledge Handbook of the Environment in Southeast Asia that just came out last year. So again, welcome, and we very much look forward to your talk. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and uh, is, it, is it okay if I, if I speak sitting down? I, I can give it sure. more. I know, I keep things a bit more intimate. Um, thanks very much to the Centre for inviting me, to, for Danny for facilitating and, uh, and, and you know, for organising uh, everything. I'm going to be speaking about land uh, today. Um, I, I'm never quite sure when I speak to an area studies uh, audience, uh, sort of what's going to uh, click and what's not, but land is one of those topics that does tend to uh, intersect with many dimensions of life and, and academia, so hopefully there'll be something for everybody that you you might relate to in terms of your own field of research. Before I start, I'd like to just say a little bit about current and recent uh, work that this talk uh, comes uh, out of. Uh, uh, I, I'm currently based at Chiang Mai University at the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences at the Regional Center for Sustainable Development at uh, Chiang, Chiang Mai University. Uh, as uh, in the introduction, uh, I uh, left Sydney University after after three year, three decades, uh, thirty years, um, in July last uh, yeah, last year. But I keep an affiliation there and and with the uh, the centre there. Um, as you mentioned, the centre has got an affiliation of three hundred staff who work on and in Southeast uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but it's a bit different from an area studies centre. Uh, uh, such as that which you've got here, in the sense that the uh, staff are all employed by the faculties uh, and schools and departments. So there are anthropologists, medical sociologists, engineers, uh, historians, uh, religious studies people, and, 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 and so on, who work on in Southeast Asia, who have an affiliation with the center and a role in the center, uh, but also uh, a place in, in uh, departments. And this was uh, the, the basic idea of setting up the center, was to draw from the wider, wider university. Uh, so I, I keep an affiliation uh, there. And uh, part of the work that I'm drawing on today, uh, taking a regional approach to uh, <coughs> looking at land, uh, land governance, uh, comes from uh, work that uh, I did while I was still based at, at Sydney, uh, together with a program called the Mekong Regional Land Governance uh, Program, uh, and which I'm currently working on uh, uh, still with Chiang Mai University, which hosts a resource hub on uh, land governance and runs various uh, programs, including an annual summer school on land governance uh, for young academics and also from uh, NGO and other uh, practitioners and activists around the region uh, working on uh, on land. Um, in many ways, it's it's a bit odd to be working on uh, land issues in 2018, in the sense that uh, the interest in agrarian studies and associated interest in uh, in land is often thought of uh, thought 
thought as being something of an agenda of the 1970s, 19, 1980s, the Cold War period, uh, Green Revolution, and, uh, and so on. And uh, is thought to have got, undergone a bit of a, a demise in the, in the 1990s. Uh, but there's been this sudden uh, re, uh, sort of rekindling of interest in, in land which lies behind not only the academic work that we're doing, but also programs that are funded by development systems, uh, donors, uh, and that are also associated with civil society and governmental programs in the countries I'm going to be talking about. So this is uh, one, one of the things that lies behind this idea of uh, revisiting contexts and rethinking concepts. It's to say, well, how is something like land, which uh, seemed to go through a bit of a hiatus or a demise in the 19. Uh, 90s uh, to 2000s. What, what's brought it? What brought it back? The the second part of the background to this um, revisiting is a program that uh, I was involved with, uh, along with a, a fairly large a cast of academics from within Southeast Asia uh, and also from uh, Europe, North America, uh, and Australia in a program called uh, Chatsi. The cha the uh, acronym is uh, short for the challenge of the, the agrarian transition in Southeast Asia. And this was a program that involved something like uh, 16 universities, about 30 core academics, and supported one way or another uh, close to 80 postgraduate theses uh, on uh, agrarian issues in Southeast Asia. It's a program that ran from 2006 until 2010, and it had the very deliberate aim of uh, of trying to address this question, what's happened to, not just to land, but what's happened to agrarian studies, uh, given that more than half the uh, population of Southeast Asia, at least at that time in the early 2000s, was still in agriculture, was still living in the countryside, uh, but where, which uh, academically had seen uh, this sort of drop off in, uh, in interest. And interestingly, that, that program was started in 2006, I guess we started talking about it uh, three or four years uh, before that well before uh, the revival in interest globally associated with the discourse and concerns about land grabbing. Because one of the things that globally has brought land back into the picture is this, uh, this term and the, uh, the imagery and the understandings associated with the global land, uh, land grab. So the, uh, the, this program actually started asking questions about, about land before that happened, but of course with the the spike in food prices in 2008, 2009, with the uh, investment of, of corporate capital uh, in land-based production, agricultural production, uh, following that, and with the uh, concern about uh, land deals, as they're sometimes termed, termed or large-scale land investments, as they're alternatively termed, or land grabs, as they're, as they're termed a bit more uh, dramatically, uh, has come a global revival of interests uh, uh, in terms of programs, in terms of uh, academic interest, but also in terms of activism uh, with, with organizations like Via Campesina, uh, the International Movement for Peasants' Rights, uh, reviving uh, an interest and reviving the uh, activity that has seen something of a, uh, a drop-off. And then the, the, third, the third sort of background to what I'm talking about now is related uh, to, actually to both of uh, both the, the Chatsi program uh, and, and the work that we're doing now. And it's, uh, it, it's a book that uh, you mentioned earlier, Bob, uh, the, uh, the book that I wrote with Tanya Lee and uh, Derek Hall uh, called Powers of Exclusion uh, and the subtitle being Land Dilemmas in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, which we wrote uh, with this, this question in mind. What's, uh, what, what's happened to this interest in land? Land has got no less important. Land, is, land as an issue has never disappeared, but the contexts have changed. So in the, uh, in the context of this Chatsi program, uh, three of us, one anthropologist, Tanya Lee, one uh, political scientist, Derek Hall, and, and myself as a geographer, uh, decided to uh, uh, look at uh, ways in which uh, land issues have uh, uh, continued to be uh, important, uh, but at the same time, uh, have seen something of a demise in terms of the uh, academic interest, and one of the, one of our, I guess, one of our hypo hypotheses at the beginning was that uh, the old concepts, the old ways of looking at things, uh, didn't quite match uh, the uh, 
rather more uh, complex ways in which land is uh, competed over, is managed, is governed, uh, and is a political object in the, uh, in the 2000s, 2010s, compared to uh, what it was in the 1970s, uh, 1980s. And so today's talk is, is sort of based around these, uh, these kinds of concerns. Um, you'll see also that uh, today's talk is framed in a regional context. Uh, it's, lo it's looking at uh, the uh, regional uh, land governance, which may seem a little bit odd to uh, those who think about land as something essentially fixed. Land is fixed in place. Land is something which is therefore quite, uh, quite local. What does it mean to think about uh, an object like uh, land? Uh, in its uh, regional context. And the region I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here is the, is the Mekong uh, region, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. Um, so in it, uh, one way to think about uh, land in a regional uh, context is uh, uh, in terms of regional issues that, first of all, uh, have a commonality across countries of the region. So it raises the question is, what, 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 are, we, uh, what are, you, are we looking at in common uh, when we look at land uh, as a uh, regional uh, topic? And there are all sorts of things we can look at. I mean, the, the sort of basic geographies of uh, uh, rice-based lowland, rice-based production and up, upland shifting cultivation may be one way in which we can look at commonalities of the way in which land has traditionally been uh, used in agriculture across uh, the region. We can also uh, look at commonalities in terms of the kinds of uh, programs that are being rolled out and the way in which they roll from one country uh, to another uh, with a, a, a spillover, a regional spillover. So one, one of those programs, I choose this one because I'll be talking about it more later, is the program of land titling, the sort of neoliberal project of establishing uh, fully alienable property rights in, uh, in land, uh, such as those that we're more familiar with in, uh, in Australia, and the kinds of questions, the kind of dilemmas uh, that throws up in terms of uh, both the security that it gives, but also the exclusions that it produces uh, in terms of who can and who can't access land, as, as land becomes a more marketed uh, uh, entity. Um, a second way in which we can think about uh, land as a regional object is to think in terms not so much of commonalities but in terms of linkages and flows that is the uh, flows in particular of capital and uh, regional investment so if we look at the patterns in the uh, Mekong region uh, we see in a kind of regional microcosm or a regional uh, sample of this uh, trend towards large-scale land deals with international uh, financial capital uh, flowing across borders for investments in in large-scale uh, land land deals, and very crudely, in the Mekong region, we three we see three countries with uh, surplus capital or capital uh, in uh, corporate entities based in those countries in the region. That is China, uh, Vietnam, and Thailand, uh, interested in and investing in uh, the land resources of the uh, capital short, but sometimes assumed to be uh, land-rich or wealthier uh, countries of Myanmar. Uh, Laos and Cambodia. So that's a very sort of basic uh, geography of the uh, regionalization of these uh, flows, that which which again creates land as a as a regional uh, a regional object. Um, and then we can uh, think about uh, regional initiatives, which also have implications for land. Uh, the Greater Mekong Subregion, uh, a program that was initiated by the Asian Development Bank, by the ADB in the early 1990s. Uh, with the uh, opening up of the uh, formerly socialist economies of uh, Indochina, of uh, Laos, Cambodia, and, uh, and, and Vietnam, and the uh, rather different uh, kind of opening up uh, in the early 1990s of uh, Burma or, 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 or Myanmar, as we, as we call it now, uh, to a foreign direct investment uh, is, 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 is uh, something which took shape as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a program with uh, economic corridors and uh, infrastructure, uh, and also the idea of creation of special economic zones, all of which have in, uh, implications locally as well and, and, in, and in border regions uh, for, uh, for uh, land ownership, land control, land, land access and exclusion. Um, and then we can also uh, see various uh, civil society organizations or international donor initi initiatives 
uh, like uh, the regional community forestry training center which has a number of programs in uh, customary land uh, tenure which is also taken up as, a, as, a, as one of the major themes now by the Mekong Region Land Governance Program. This is a program funded by the, initially by the Swiss government, by SDC, uh, but now also by the governments of Germany and, and Luxembourg uh, to try to, uh, to in, in, in principle, try to uh, create secure, more secure access to uh, land and, uh, and rights over land uh, by those whose uh, security over their uh, land holding has been has been diminished. That is the uh, that is the ethnic minorities, the rural poor, smallholders, uh, women, uh, and uh, uh, and other groups deemed to be uh, under threat by the uh, by these macro uh, macro uh, trends. Um, and then there are also activist organisations like Focus on the Global South, uh, which which campaigns along with uh, with uh, more uh, local partners against in various instances of. Uh, land grabbing, whether it's by the military in Burma, whether it's by uh, uh, industrial uh, estates or <coughs> residential estates in Peri urban Vietnam, whether it's by uh, cross-border investments like those I mentioned uh, coming from uh, Thailand, Vietnam, or, or Laos in southern, uh, or sorry, or China in southern Laos or north eastern Cambodia, uh, and uh, and so on. And then there are also uh, various ways in which uh, different uh, land uses have material effects across borders. Uh, uh, for example, uh, with plantation development, we're used to hearing about the smoke haze in uh, in another part of Southeast Asia, uh, between Indonesia, Singapore, and uh, and Malaysia. But we can also look at uh, uh, the situation in northern Thailand, for example, where around this time of year, uh, most years in Chiang Mai, the uh, the question of smoke haze becomes a perennial uh, political uh, as well as health and environmental uh, issue and and uh, from time to time uh, the uh, practices of uh, farmers in uh, in Myanmar or, or Laos are, are blamed uh, in, in seeking uh, seeking culprits. Uh, of course it becomes more interesting when you look at the uh, background to these changing practices because part of the changing practices have to do with the very cross-border investments such as <coughs> uh, agribusiness investments in maize in northern uh, Shan State in, in Myanmar or the uh, Chinese investments in, in uh, bananas or uh, rubber cultivation and the clearing of land in, in northern Laos. So we see, we see linkages between these, these different uh, elements. So that's, uh, the, uh, that's uh, the background to land as a, as a regional issue. The region in question that we're looking at is the, uh, the Mekong uh, region. Of course, the uh, the term the Mekong for this region is more of a metaphor than a material uh, reality. And we're not just talking about the river. We're not just talking about the uh, the basin uh, which drains into the river. But the uh, Mekong region, uh, in for example, the ADB's uh, GMS or Greater Mekong Subregion Program, uh, includes the whole land area of Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and, and Cambodia, as well as two provinces of southern China, Quang Chi and, and Yunnan, uh, with a population about four times uh, that uh, of the population actually resident within the uh, Mekong Basin it, itself. So uh, the Mekong here is, a, is more of a metaphor, and it's a metaphor, I'd suggest, uh, uh, of, of, of a number of things, but, but mainly of the idea of linkage associated with regional economic integration uh, and, and post-Cold War regional economic integration. Early on, the ADB uh, used in many of its documents uh, promoting the idea of the GMS, the idea of, the, of a peace dividend, a post-Cold War a dividend, a post-conflict uh, dividend. So um, this is a, a, a region that has, has, has come together, but also has a history of being fractured, of being the, uh, in effect, the, the front line of the, the Cold War during the 1950s, uh, 60s, uh, and uh, 70s through the late 80s until the Paris Peace, peace Agreements in in Cambodia, um, and where land uh, was a significant element in uh, in that uh, period of uh, of conflict on on both sides, uh, on the revolutionary side, in the sense that uh, the revolutionary movements that led uh, first in uh, it was what was then North Vietnam and was now Northern Vietnam uh, to the uh, successful. Uh, rise of the Communist Party in, in, in Northern Vietnam, a significant part of that was the uh, so-called land to the tiller uh, campaigns, 
to, uh, to try to uh, raise peasant support uh, in, in the face of extreme landlordism, extreme inequality, uh, partly uh, but not entirely associated with the, uh, with the French colonial uh, uh, regime. Uh, and, uh, and elsewhere we've, uh, we've seen extreme cases of the uh, reorganization of society through the re reorganization of land, the most extreme of course being under the Khmer regime in the uh, mid to late 1970s under, under Pol Pot, where uh, all land uh, was, uh, uh, all, all, and, and all uh, private, land, private holdings uh, were uh, assembled and, and, and merged together in, in large scale uh, collectives uh, in, in, in northern Vietnam, and then after 1975, again, in, in also in southern Vietnam, initially uh, land was, uh, land was uh, collectivized. In Laos, uh, the collectivization never went through uh, the say, to the same degree, only about a quarter of all villages in Laos were collectivized only for a very short period of time. Uh, Myanmar had its own rather strange version of socialism under, under the Nguyen uh, regime in the 1960s, 1970s, the so-called Burmese uh, 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 path to socialism. socialism. Uh, and uh, it didn't involve large-scale collectivization, but involved heavy state involvement in, uh, in agriculture uh, through uh, strict procurement uh, uh, policies. Uh, whereas in Thailand, uh, there's been much more continuity in uh, in land, uh, land holding, land tenure, uh, tenure arrangements. Uh, Thailand has had a land titling program that in effect goes back to the early 20th century, but in uh, was accelerated rapidly in the, uh, in the uh, mid 19 80s, but based on a land law that goes back to the 1950s, uh, based on a model of private ownership of uh, land, of individual ownership of land in private areas, and then since the mid-1970s uh, of individual, uh, in, of limited individual rights over land, land even in public areas under the uh, Agricultural Land Reform, uh, Reform Act. Since the uh, end of the uh, Cold War. There's been a series of uh, series of reforms since the early 19, uh, well, the late 1980s, early 1990s, in the formerly uh, fully socialized economies. Uh, there's been a return, rather like in China, to a household responsibility system, uh, to an individual individualization first of agricultural production and uh, eventually uh, of a, a degree of of land titling, uh, partly through uh, uh, international programs. Uh, Funded by the World Bank and with the assistance of the Australian government, and partly, uh, partly through particularly in Vietnam, through uh, domestic uh, programs of return to uh, peasant-based uh, household farming on a on a small holder uh, model of, uh, of production, uh, given uh, given the crises in, in collectivized uh, production. So that's uh, uh, these are some of the commonalities and and, and trends, uh, and also. Uh, uh, this is something which shows the convergence of agendas in uh, in land issues, which is part of the uh, regionalization of uh, of land as the formerly uh, socialized economies have moved more now towards a, a small holder, holder pattern of production. But at the same time, while all this has been going on, there's been a great deal of concentration of land since the early 1990s uh, to the uh, the present um, through essentially two main main processes. Uh, first of all. Uh, through the market processes that have allowed buying and selling of land uh, and the concentration of land in countries like Thailand, for example, whose agriculture <coughs> is still largely smallholder based, uh, but within which uh, there's a great deal of inequality of, uh, of land, uh, land holding. As land has become not only the basis for commodity, commodity production, but as land has become a commodity in itself, uh, there's been a concentration of uh, land, particularly uh, in areas uh, which are legally alienable. That is, uh, uh, the approximately one third of the land area of the country, uh, which is held under private land title. But also, increasingly, within the small holding areas that are on public land uh, that are classed uh, as various forms of state land, now mainly under the uh, Agricultural Land Reform Office, but also under various uh, uh, forest department and other uh, other types of public uh, land title. In 
in Laos, uh, similarly, the land titling program has uh, taken off, as it has in, in Cambodia, with, with foreign assistance. And there's been, there's been a great deal of uh, buying and selling of land, but with, still without the same degree of concentration of small holding land on title land. The big concentration of land in, uh, in, Viet in, sorry, in Cambodia and Laos has come uh, with uh, what some term a, uh, uh, an extreme form of reverse land reform with the granting of large scale land concessions uh, to international investors in order to attract uh, Vietnamese, Chinese and Thai capital uh, into rubber production, banana production, uh, sugarcane production, cassava production. And, and so on. And much of the land that has been uh, given over to uh, these uh, foreign direct investments in uh, large scale concessions uh, 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 is, is, is land uh, that has nominally been held under various forms of state, uh, state ownership. Now, given the, uh, given the post socialist reforms, this is a very open. Uh, category in uh, in the formerly socialized economies of uh, Laos and, uh, and and Cambodia. Um, I'll move on uh, now to uh, to uh, go back and look more specifically at uh, the uh, ways in which uh, the 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 way in which uh, land has been uh, studied have changed over time. And what I'm going to do is, is talk about two main, two main things. One is to talk about the, 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 the changing uh, paradigms uh, that have, uh, have characterized uh, interest in uh, land associated with events over the, the, this period of time. And then sec secondly, I'm, go, I'm going to go back and uh, uh, look at the same uh, different periods and look at the uh, conceptual underpinnings of interest uh, in land to try to uh, relate how these changing contexts uh, of, of land associated with these paradigms uh, have uh, demanded a, a conceptual uh, rethinking of the way in which we understand land, uh, particularly uh, in a situation of uh, a move away from largely agrarian, heavily subsistence-based production to a much more complex uh, set of interests in, in land. So if we go back quickly to the uh, 19 uh, uh, period, in the 1960s to the uh, 1980s, uh, the, perhaps the height of the Cold War, the height of the well, not so Cold War in Southeast Asia, the, uh, the, the hot war, the revolutions, the, uh, the uh, uh, so-called Vietnam War or American War, depending on where you're, uh, where you're talking about it. Um, during this period of time, there are two main main contexts uh, that we can look at uh, for this uh, paradigm of land as a basis for agrarian conflict. Uh, one is the Cold War context uh, it, itself, and the uh, the interests of backers on both on both sides uh, to uh, try to uh, secure the hearts and minds of the uh, of the uh, potentially or actually revolutionary peasantry uh, through various uh, programs of of land reform. Uh, the second is the context of the Green Revolution, which isn't uh, itself totally unrelated to the Cold War context, uh, given that the Green Revolution, uh, as promoted through the International Rice Research Institute, through IRI, was in, its, in itself partly a Cold War a project of uh, the US government and, uh, and, and, and US-based uh, based foundations uh, to try to raise the, uh, the standard of living in Southeast Asian countries as a preemptive move against the uh, spread of, of, of communism in the country, countryside. Um, so during this period of time, we can uh, we can see, as I said before, the uh, the resonance of, of slogans like "land to the tiller," the uh, the uh, idea of agrarian uh, justice being promoted uh, initially by the uh, by uh, revolutionaries in, uh, in in northern Vietnam uh, in. Uh, Thailand, even by the Communist Party of, uh, of Thailand from the 1970s, uh, uh, but also as a preemptive counter-revolutionary me measure. So you can see this postage stamp here, for example, which comes from uh, Nguyen Van Thieu's uh, uh, South, South Vietnam in the late 1960s, 1970s, uh, which calls for uh, uh, 
the planters have the rice fields that are land, land to the tillers, essentially. I put up this, uh, this slide here uh, just by way of sort of interesting contrast. This is actually jumping, uh, jumping up to almost the present. This is a, a, a land protest uh, in, in Vietnam only three or four uh, years ago, and it uses a very similar slogan. Uh, it says, return land to those who, uh, who, uh, who plant it, those who cultivate it, uh, return, return land to the tillers, in effect. And this is the, the context of this is uh, the context is actually behind most uh, current land disputes in, in Vietnam, which are not about agrarian land relations per se. They're about the seizure of land uh, for conversion of peri-urban uh, areas uh, for industry, for infrastructure, for housing estates, for golf courses, uh, for, for, for tourist, tourism, uh, which uh, trigger the sense of injustice in a country where uh, marching like this is not, it's not straightforward and, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not a safe, a safe process, and yet which has been uh, where concerns have been sufficient to bring, to bring uh, people out. I, I gave a talk, by the way, in, in, at a regional forum on land uh, in Hanoi a, a couple of years ago, and I was going to put up this slide, but I was asked to keep it off the, uh, off the screens uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the interest of the safety of the um, or the comfort of the of the conference organizers. So this is actually a very sensitive issue uh, still in Vietnam. It's partly because it has this has this resonance back uh, to this this period of time, but it's based in, in a very uh, more uh, diverse and complex set of interests uh, inland. Um, I think this publication, some of you may be familiar uh, with it, it's a, it's a kind of seminal publication uh, from this uh, period. It marks the culmination of this interest in land as a basis. Agrarian uh, conflict. It was published in 1989. It's called Agrarian Transformations, Local uh, Processes in the State in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and it's, it's a culmination partly because it was such a, uh, a well received uh, and comprehensive book based on, on four countries, four countries that had been uh, through largely market based uh, trans transformations Malaysia, Thailand, uh, uh, Indonesia, and the uh, and the Philippines, both with countrywide and, and, and local case study analysis, analyses, but also because it was published in 1989 at this period, uh, which uh, marked the uh, the end of this sort of sharp division between uh, socialist and non-socialist Southeast Asia, uh, and also uh, uh, at a time where the interest turned not only uh, away from the uh, sort of Cold War era conflicts, but also uh, to the interest in the de-agrarianization, de peasantization So you may be familiar with Jonathan Riggs' work on uh, the move away from agriculture uh, in, in terms of uh, livelihoods and the diversification, not necessarily people moving out of agriculture altogether, uh, but with urbanization, industrialization, uh, it simply reinforced uh, the interest in other things than agrarian basis for uh, a class, class conflict. And in part then, this, uh, this uh, also marked the start of what we sometimes call the neoliberal uh, era and, and association uh, of, of land and other uh, uh, political economic, economic issues uh, with the, uh, the rise of capital. Um, the, the term turning land into capital, I'll, call, I'll come back to this when I talk about uh, some of the conceptual underpinnings here, but the idea of turning land into capital was, was something which, uh, which grabbed a lot of interest in the uh, 1980s, uh, 1990s, partly with the issuing of these uh, Chinook or the uh, land titles, the full land titles, private land titles in, uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, which saw a massive increase for only, from only a couple of million land titles in 1984 to uh, close to 15 million land titles uh, today, covering in, 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 uh, in the early 1980s, the concern in Thailand was that uh, despite the fact that about a third of the land was defined as private land, only a very small proportion of that had full land title on it, so there was a lot of amb ambiguity. <coughs> and at the current rates of uh, of land uh, titling, land registration, it, it was going to take 200 years to uh, to complete the registration. So the World Bank and the Australian government came in with a program which is now almost completely uh, fully titled uh, land, which means that a third of land in Thailand is fully alienable uh, 
title. Uh, but it also came with uh, a, uh, a, a somewhat later on, from the 1990s uh, onwards, in, in Vietnam and, and Cambodia in particular, um, the interest of uh, government in turning what was seen to be not only an underused resource but uh, an abundant resource, i.e. land and, uh, and uh, associated uh, forests and other, other uh, resources, but also a resource that was being used in a backwards or primitive way. Uh, as, as something which would be, could be put into the modern economy and could be seen as a, as a source of, uh, of revenue. Uh, and, and, and hence uh, the opening up of uh, large areas of land for concessions in Laos up to 10,000 hectares each, but in fact uh, more than that given that many companies simply uh, did deals of a number of, uh, uh, a, a number of 10,000 hectare plots as part of one uh, one larger deal, often doing deals with central government in, in the case of, of Laos. The largest of these is of these corporate actors is the uh, is Vietnam, Vietnam's largest uh, private enterprise, which is the originally real estate based, but now also uh, agribusiness uh, company, the Huang An Jia Lai uh, uh, company, which invests in uh, in rubber, in uh, in coffee, and in other uh, in other commodities. Uh, in southern Laos and northeastern uh, Cambodia, um, at the expense of shifting cultivators of farmers uh, who have traditionally uh, used that land, but who have ha not had uh, rights over over that land. And with this in mind, this is also something which uh, I guess makes me and some others wary about uh, going too far with the use of post-socialism as a way of characterizing uh, the changes since the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, uh, when we talk about uh, these economies, particularly in Laos and Vietnam, which remain one-party states. Uh, but it, uh, it isn't only the, uh, uh, the fact that these are states that are currently uh, still, uh, like China, of course, under uh, one-party communist rule. Uh, but with largely market-based economies, there's also an uh, ideology of socialist modernization that has persisted uh, and which is, is also uh, behind the, the granting of any activity which will modernize, which will, uh, which will eradicate uh, primitive or uh, practices that are seen to be uh, backwards and environmentally uh, destructive and non-modern, such as shifting cult cultivation. So this lies behind uh, many, uh, many of the, uh, the uh, conflicts. Um, then there's also uh, not only investment in land concessions, but also land-hungry activities such as mining, uh, hydropower development in, in Laos in particular, but increasingly in, in Cambodia uh, and in Myanmar uh, as well. And the process of, uh, as I mentioned before, of regionalization, the uh, movement of capital uh, across uh, borders. Move ahead uh, a decade to the 2000s uh, and we see the uh, emergence of this discourse on uh, land grabbing, not only as a regional but as a global process, particularly uh, in the aftermath of the 2008-2009 spike in land, uh, sorry, in food and, and, and commodity uh, prices and the opening, uh, partly with the support of uh, large financial institutions like uh, the World Bank, the uh, the opening uh, of large areas of land uh, that were classed as wasteland or non-productive land or land that was being underutilized uh, to try to uh, deal with the global food problem as it was uh, seen in the in the aftermath of this uh, uh, panic with the uh, spike in. Food, in food and commodity uh, uh, prices. Uh, so we can see this uh, global land grab in terms of land deals, and certainly uh, some of the land deals that I uh, mentioned just now, uh, for example, with companies uh, from Vietnam, also companies uh, from Thailand, such as uh, Konkan Sugar, in, which invests in, uh, in land deals in, in Cambodia at the expense of small holders who are kicked off their land to give, uh, uh, to give uh, uh, the Thai sugar companies and their uh, their Cambodian 
co-investors who are mostly cronies of, uh, of uh, Hun, Hun Sen access uh, to, uh, to land. Um, we, uh, we see these land grabs, but we also see a much more complex situation. So there's been something of a the rollback of the, uh, the use of the term land grabbing or, or a problematization, problematization of the use of the term land grabbing uh, in <coughs> the uh, Mekong uh, region. Uh, given that uh, not all of the alienation of uh, land uh, from farmers takes the obvious form of large-scale corporate investments across borders. First of all, a significant amount of the alienation is domestic in origin, either as part of joint ventures uh, or in Myanmar particularly with the history of, uh, of military uh, grabbing uh, and, and the ambiguity in uh, whether such grabbing of land is uh, for uh, public purposes, that is for uh, genuine uh, military uh, camps and, and uh, military purposes, or whether it's for the, uh, the private benefit of, uh, of public actors. Uh, or in, in the case of Cambodia, where, where much of the, uh, uh, the large-scale investment of, uh, of land has, has actually come from uh, domestic uh, supporters of uh, Hun Sen, the so-called Ok Nya, or the, the, the wealthy uh, tycoons who are the uh, uh, collaborators with, uh, uh, with, with, with Hun Sen. So, so one, of the, one of the reasons for questioning the, this narrative of the land grab as something that's essentially transnational in character is that there's a great deal of, uh, of local uh, corporate involvement. The second, a second is that not, not all of it is necessarily large scale in uh, 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 large in uh, large in scale. There are many investments, particularly in northern Laos, for example, where we see in a massive conversion of the landscape, initially uh, from shifting cultivation to <coughs> rubber, with the boom in, in rubber in the mid two thousands, um, and then with the partly with with the collapse in rubber prices, uh, with with declining demand or declining growth in demand in China, uh, the conversion of whole landscapes uh, to bananas. So it's very easy to look at a landscape like this and see this as a large scale uh, land grab, mainly under Chinese capital in, in northern Laos. But if you look at the detail here, this is actually um, a, a very large number of quite small investments by uh, smaller investors uh, from China. The pattern in northern Laos and uh, southern Laos is quite different in that way. Southern Laos tends to be larger uh, plantations and northern Laos tends to be uh, smaller scale uh, plant, uh, plantations. Uh, there's a very interesting article by uh, Cecil uh, Friss and, uh, and others uh, that looks at uh, in detail, that drills down to some of the uh, mechanisms for what they end up uh, referring to not as land grabs but following John Barras uh, and Jenny Franco's uh, terminology, uh, what they term con control grabs, in the sense that not only are these grabs not large scale individually in character, uh, but also they uh, often end up with farmers retaining the nominal ownership of their land, but the control over the land uh, rests with the investor. So this complicates the idea of the land grab of, as something that, which, which takes uh, land away from the small uh, smallholders. They look at the mechanisms by which this is done. One of the interesting mechanisms is, is that many of the investors have got an ethnic affiliation uh, in China which transcends the boundary. Uh, so there are Tai Lu, uh, there are uh, Hani, Akka, uh, there are Mian, uh, and, uh, uh, and Mong who come across the borders speak the same language as the village leaders where the land is uh, land deals are being negotiated and the land land deals are done in some cases voluntary voluntarily but in some cases with a degree of, of pressure either pressure from the village head to serve as brokers or uh, what we might call ecological uh, pressure in the sense that when uh, sufficient numbers of surrounding uh, farms uh, convert from uh, lowland rice to bananas it becomes impossible to continue to grow rice because of the uh, uh, destruction of land boundaries, irrigation systems, use of chemicals, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So we see a much more complicated picture than straightforward, uh, straightforward land grabs. Um, 
and we see control graphs. We also see various measures uh, to try to uh, resist or at least to, to tone down uh, land grabbing. And, and hence we come to the, uh, what I call maybe the current uh, era where the sort of zeitgeist or the paradigm is that of land, uh, land governance, seeking ways uh, to try to ameliorate, to control uh, these uh, large scale, what some have called reverse land reforms, uh, the uh, concentration of land in the hands of those with access to, uh, to capital uh, through various policies, legal mechanisms, uh, uh, new institutions, uh, stakeholder processes that try to bring uh, private actors, uh, community actors, landholders, and state authorities uh, uh, together, um, and uh, which uh, uh, also uh, try to uh, bring the experience of different countries in the region together. So I mentioned before the Mekong Region Land Governance Program. This is one such program whose uh, who remit, uh, uh, supported by the uh, international uh, donors who uh, finance this program, the, the Swiss, the Luxembourg, and the German government, the remit is to, is to increase land security, to provide, to provide various protections uh, for uh, smallholders, for ethnic minorities, for women, for those seem to be most vulnerable uh, to these uh, uh, insecu insecurities. Uh, and this, this program uh, works in the uh, CLMV country, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, uh, and, and uh, Myanmar, as you can see, with a great big uh, hole in the middle called Thailand. Um, the reason it, uh, the program doesn't work in Thailand is not that the issues aren't relevant there, uh, but simply because these are donor organizations and most, uh, most foreign don donors have long since withdrawn from working in Thailand. So it's a rather strange regional program that doesn't actually work in uh, the country with the most experience in, in land governance in, uh, in the region. Um, the, the program's are currently moving into its second phase and it's, go it's going to be uh, focusing on the two main issues that are seen to have emerged as the most sort of promising in terms of it making uh, uh, some kind of leeway in land governance. And the first of those is, is trying to find legal provision, uh, sorry, legal recognition of customary tenure arrangements because uh, customary tenure is seen as one uh, type of protection uh, short of full legal recognition of shifting cultivation, rotational cultivation, or traditional practices, or ethnic, ethnically uh, specific practices. Customary tenure is seen as one, uh, one channel for doing so. The second is, uh, comes under the, uh, under the rubric of responsible uh, land investments, uh, responsible uh, land, land investments, the idea of working uh, with rather than necessarily confronting uh, corporate uh, actors, uh, but also with states to provide uh, better informed regulatory measures uh, to at least ameliorate uh, some of the <coughs> dominant uh, processes of land uh, land alienation. So these are the uh, the various uh, uh, paradigms we can see. But behind all of these, of course, are if we if we're looking at these academically, uh, are various conceptual. Uh, uh, frameworks. Um, uh, you'll see a picture here of uh, of Carl Polanyi, uh, who's uh, who's, um, uh, who's whose work has suddenly uh, come back into uh, into fashion and 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 and, and significance and relevance uh, in in the region. But I think before we talk about Polanyi, it's it's it's, it's worth going back even further to uh, looking right back at uh, the uh, original. Uh, formulation of the agrarian question in uh, of, of Karl Kautsky, this whole question about what's the future of smallholder smallholders in uh, in a capitalist economy. This goes back to uh, 20th century Europe, 20, early 20th century uh, Russia, uh, of course. But it's a question that uh, is still is still there to some extent, given given the number of. Uh, smallholders who continue to form the backbone of agriculture in the Mekong region and in many other parts of the world. Uh, where pa Polanyi uh, uh, comes in, I think, is uh, is that he uh, his his work in the Great Transformation in encapsulates the fund fundamental dilemma of um, the marketization of agriculture 
uh, which is the, uh, uh, the dilemma on the one hand of uh, providing security uh, through property rights, through annual, annual property rights, those which we're used to in countries like, uh, like Australia or, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the concentration of uh, wealth uh, that land as a uh, as something which is commoditized in what uh, uh, Polanyi's terms is a fictional uh, commodity uh, becomes a an, an object of, of of concentration, and hence uh, this constant uh, uh, interplay between, on the one hand, the movements of uh, states uh, keen to uh, uh, mobilize the forces of production uh, through uh, capital, on the other hand, being concerned with the impacts that that has, and, and therefore uh, the uh, countermeasures through land reforms, or all the countermeasures coming from beyond the state in uh, civil society or revolutionary movements, and, uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, but then we, we move to the, uh, the uh, more, more recent period, the, the interest in, in capital, the idea of uh, turning uh, land into capital, which is something associated more than anybody else with the, uh, the writing and influence of the Peruvian economist uh, Hernando de Soto in his book, The Mystery of Capital. His idea that uh, land uh, which has not been uh, fully registered, which is not fully alienable, and therefore fully mortgageable is in a sense dead capital, uh, that you're punishing the poor by not allowing them to uh, put their land onto capital markets essentially, uh, and, you, and that the way to uh, mobilize the wealth of the poor is to bring this dead capital to, uh, to life uh, as collateral for investment uh, for their own agricultural production, uh, or if they so wish to, uh, as a commodity, uh, to sell to more productive users of, uh, of land and, and for them to move up and do something else or to invest in their children's education or, or something else. Um, and at the uh, whole of economy level of land as a financial asset uh, for underpinning or underwriting uh, economic, uh, economic activity. And is this uh, influence uh, this, uh, that's behind many of the land titling programs that are, that are spread across the uh, region? Uh, uh, but also, which uh, warn, uh, uh, warn us against the, the limits to uh, individual uh, titling, partly because there's only ever going to be a, a certain amount of a country's land area that will be titled, uh, and also because of the uh, potential for concentration of land that we've, uh, that we've uh, seen. And then finally, uh, and it's moving towards our own uh, more recent uh, work, is the uh, uh, conceptual approach uh, which looks at new contexts of uh, land and exclusion, partly based in this, uh, 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 I would say, obsession, but this preoccupation with creating pro property rights and the, and the standing back and asking, what does that really mean in terms of not only the uh, right to, but also the ability to benefit? Uh, from land. Nancy Peluso's and uh, Jerry, uh, Jesse Ribos' uh, 2003 article on, uh, on uh, a theory of access is, is, a, is a key uh, part of uh, this conceptual development. And it's partly off this that we uh, based our own work. Uh, asking questions, first of all, of uh, why it is that there has been this demise in interest uh, in uh, in land at, at an acad academic level, uh, given not only the uh, the continuing significance of land, but also the continuing expansion of agriculture, not in relative terms, but in but in absolute uh, uh, terms, and we uh, came came up with the idea of using the concept of exclusion as a key lens through which to uh, try to uh, understand the much more complex ways in which much more diverse uh, actors are competing with and are uh, gaining access to land at the expense of, uh, of others. Uh, we uh, use exclusion not in a normative uh, sense, not in the sense of, uh, uh, of uh, something to be uh, uh, 
uh, to be fought against because exclusion, as we see it, is the basis of any kind of productive land use, but rather exclusion as an analytical category and is something which is always uh, double-edged. One person's exclusion is another uh, uh, is a, it one, one person's exclusion is, 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 is another person's uh, ability to benefit from, uh, from that thing, whether it's land or, uh, or something else. And what we do is we, uh, we use this as a way to ask the question, well, what, what is it that gives uh, states, that gives uh, private actors, that gives uh, farmers, that gives ethnic groups, that gives uh, uh, corporate actors uh, the power to exclude uh, Others and we, we look at that specifically within the agrarian context of uh, Southeast Asia, and we look we uh, look at four main uh, powers: that of the uh, regulation, partly but not entirely uh, regulation by the state. We can also see other forms of regulation in community-based natural resource management, in in various other uh, processes. The power of the market, the power of brute force, which we still see in uh, in many cases going beyond uh, 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 the use of law, ex extra legal uh, use of, uh, of force. And uh, last but certainly not least, the, the power of legi legitimation, the power of ideas about, the, the, if you like, the moral basis uh, for excluding others from land. In the book, we uh, look at that through a number of processes, the process of formalization uh, through which uh, uh, land titling is, is carried out, for example, uh, but also uh, with regard to emerging agendas around conservation, some of them being the obvious ones, like uh, the creation of national parks and the exclusion uh, of people from uh, the ability to continue to practice farming in, in those areas, uh, but also through various other, other green, uh, green agendas, such as community-based natural resource management and even the uh, association of some large-scale uh, Hydropower and other projects uh, as uh, as conservation as conservation projects, uh, and then we have we look at other processes uh, like uh, the expansion of boom crops like rubber prawns coffee uh, as another context through which to look at uh, these powers and 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 and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we're left then uh, finally with uh, the uh, the question of what current agenda design land research. Uh, in the Mekong region. How do we uh, continue to uh, research uh, land in a, uh, in a, in a uh, context which is not uh, post-agrarian uh, but has moved well beyond uh, small-scale agriculture as the, as the main context for uh, understanding land issues? How do we move beyond the agrarian uh, fixation? Um, last week we, we had a very interesting uh, full day workshop in, in Bangkok uh, based on a series of studies uh, that had been uh, carried out by four young academics and one, well three young academics and one uh, civil society uh, uh, worker uh, trying to look at some of the new agendas in uh, Thailand beyond uh, small-scale agriculture as a, as a context for uh, looking at land uh, issues. These, these were studies that actually came out of a summer school that we'd uh, run a couple of years ago in, in mid-2016 uh, as part of our, our annual series of summer schools uh, on land governance in in Southeast Asia, and some of the uh, agendas that uh, that the these studies came up with were, first of all, uh, to look much more at urban and peri-urban agendas, peri-urban areas in particular, as the spaces in between those have actually, which have actually uh, suffered, from, suffered from a very uh, a very few studies, a very uh, a dearth of studies, uh, despite the fact that in some ways they're the most dynamic uh, areas. Are subject to both urban and rural in, uh, rural influences, uh, but they f uh, they fall between uh, between the gaps when it comes to uh, land governance. We also uh, heard from uh, uh, one study that was looking at uh, green agendas, not only looking at national parks, but looking at how, for example, uh, the development of alter alter alternative energy in the form of biofuels on the one hand, uh, as as being 
behind some of the boom, pro boom crops in the in the region, but also the use of land reform uh, areas uh, for wind farms and non-agricultural uh, uses had generated a whole uh, new set of exclusions and debates around around them. We heard one from uh, on on boom boom crops specifically, and one that looked at the regional context uh, through what's happening on Thailand's borders with the creation of 10 special economic zones and the circumventing of uh, normal uh, legal uh, measures uh, on land appropriation. Um, so, in, so in some, out of, out of uh, these sorts of uh, studies and, and also thinking where, where we are now, there's a, a need to uh, understand where uh, the conceptual development of studies around land has come from, so certainly not to forget what uh, the, uh, the sort of heyday of uh, land research uh, was under the, uh, uh, the Green Revolution and so on in the 1960s, but also to understand the very uh, much more complex uh, context in which uh, land is now being uh, discussed as a regional rather than just a national or local issue, uh, as a uh, post-agrarian, as well as, a, uh, as an agricultural issue, as not just a smallholders issue, but also one associated with large-scale uh, land developments. And I'll uh, leave it there and uh, open up for any questions or observations. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> about 20 minutes about for questions, if anybody I'd like to start off. I used to try to link uh, land issues with a place where I'm talking, but I was going to ask you about Myanmar. Actually. Well, 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 first of all, I know very little about Hong Kong, <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, it seems to me that Hong Kong must be a very interesting place to look at land, and I wonder whether any of these. So the questions about exclusion and so on have any resonance in such a different context. Fine, that's where I question back. But yeah, with Myanmar. Sure. Yeah, Myanmar, because you were recently there to present at a conference and Man in Mandalay. Were you presenting on something specifically related to Myanmar? Actually, I, I was at the conference not to oh, present, okay. but to but to help help uh, uh, make some comments on first of all the pre-conference workshop mm -hmm. uh, where a, uh, about 50 young uh, Myanmar researchers uh, presented their uh, their work as a kind of kind of practice, uh, mm -hmm. and then and then at some uh, sessions, uh, which some of which were on land. But the other thing which I was doing actually with, 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 with Taptim uh, here is uh, that we were running a program on land research for six young uh, researchers working with the Land Corps Group, which is an umbrella non-governmental group working with many civil society organizations around the country, uh, and also nine civil society organization uh, staff, uh, three from Chin State, three from Shan State, and three from Mon State. Uh, who are developing their own, who want to develop their own research skills, very much oriented to advocacy. In Myanmar, more than in any other country in the region, land is the core of everything. It's the core of so much uh, social conflict, and it's also the background of something which I, I, I haven't had time to mention, but I think it's, it's in some ways one of the most interesting uh, issues common. It's very obvious in Myanmar, but it's also uh, over a slightly longer period of time common to the rest of the region, which is encapsulated in a term that Kevin Woods, who writes about uh, Myanmar a lot, has, uh, has uh, coined, which is ceasefire capitalism. Mm -hmm. and, and the essential idea here is, it goes back to this idea that, that, I, that I mentioned in, in the context of the ADB, with the idea of the so-called peace dividend, that we have one set of conflicts, one set of tensions, which uh, Fortunately, uh, 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 now they've gone. In the case of the, uh, the sort of hot conflict of the uh, the war in Indochina, um, or certainly ameliorated, but by no means disappeared. In the case of the ethnic armed conflicts, uh, uh, fighting with the government in 
in, in Myanmar. But with that comes immediately a new set of conflicts uh, as the region is made safe for capital, or safe for these uh, sorts of investments, which, uh, which generates a new set of conflicts uh, as uh, the this peace dividend is reached, or the particular case that uh, Kevin Woods, or one particular case that Kevin Woods is talking about in Myanmar, is the case of Thai, uh, Thai agribusiness capital uh, engaging in contract farming in Northern Shan State, uh, particularly for production of CP maize. CP is the, or Jerome Pokapan is the Thai uh, agribusiness corporation. Uh, con concern for the Chinese market. So we see we see different you know, different country actors and different uh, different roles. But what's what's key in, in this is that many of the uh, interlocutors or many of the uh, brokers in this process are the elites of the ethnic armed groups. So we see the demise of one form of conflict and the emergence of in, of new uh, not just ethnic relations but also class relations as part of that process. I think it's something that's it's, it's got a much more general resonance in the uh, move, uh, in, in, in the peace process. Uh, and again, it's <coughs> not to decry the peace process, but it's to, it's to recognize the potential uh, for the opening up of borders, uh, for the intensification of competition over land and the exclusionary processes uh, that occur as a result. And of course, the, the civil society uh, uh, activists who we're, we're working with as we work on research uh, are at the forefront of all that. Land conflict and land grabbing is nothing new to them. They've been suffering uh, from it with the military. But it, it's, as they report it, it's, it's intensified. You know, it's, 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 it's enhanced uh, rather than ameliorated as a result of the, uh, the peace process. So we have a, you know, a lot of challenges that come with these generally positive developments in a country like Myanmar, um, but there's, you know, there's another layer to deal with uh, as, a, as a result. Uh, thanks, Professor Hirsch, for a really interesting talk. Uh, I would like to know more about the regional context, whether China's land system and land uh, reform has any impacts in the Southeast Asian um, um, context, um, especially now with this FDI, because I realize a lot of these Chinese investors, uh, when they come to, for example, Northern Laos, they have a very strong idea of how things should work uh, based on the Chinese way, and, and, yes. and assuming they should follow the same. So I, I just wonder whether they, for example, when they, when, when now the, the governments are thinking of custom land tenure, like the process in Laos, whether they, they actually learn something or, or of the experience in China. Um, from my understanding, my, from, from, from to, to my knowledge, in some ways, first of all, the, I mean, the Chinese reforms, agrarian reforms, even though China leads in many things, in, in some ways the Chinese reforms have come later. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the the collectivization uh, of land, the individualization of, uh, of land in China has has been much slower than it has been in uh, in the case of, of Laos, uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia in its, in its, in its own uh, context. But on the other hand, the emergence of Chinese capital has certainly been you know been uh, been leading, and China is without doubt the dominant uh, the dominant. Uh, uh, Layer. But as you say, I mean, with with uh, Chinese investors coming along, uh, they bring along their own understandings and uh, and models of what's appropriate. But are working in, to my understanding, again, are working in a less regulated environment mm -hmm. or less effectively regulated environment than they would be in their own country. And I think one open question, one very interesting research question, is. Uh, the extent to which the investment of these uh, actors across borders from China uh, in the uh, in, in rubber or banana cultivation in Laos, for example, or, or uh, in, uh, in Cambodia, in, in, uh, in northern uh, Myanmar, whether this is simply a question of land availability or whether it's also a result of greater ease of 
certain types of investment uh, compared to uh, what those investors would face within uh, within China. Uh, and I, I, I don't, I don't know that others, others may have a, a better partial answer to that question, but I haven't really seen much uh, or I think of any uh, research has really sort of framed things in those ways. I've asked, you know, following your question of to what extent the Chinese way of doing things is being uh, exported. Certainly there are many parts of northern Myanmar or uh, northern Laos that feel more Chinese in terms of the economic activity that's going on in terms of the way things are, uh, things are run. And certainly Chinese investors have a um, I, I think have a, a, a facility or an advantage in doing business uh, in compared to uh, compared to non Southeast Asian or non Asian uh, investors in, 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 in the way they negotiate with local village brokers and, and so on. Have, have you done? I mean, have you have you done any similar research in in southern China that would help to address this question because I'm, I'm working yeah. for NGO so I'm not really a researcher right, um, right I but I would uh, yeah I'm interested in knowing that mm. and I'm from southern China right uh, mm. but I don't I don't I, because I have not done mm. research so, but that's a very really interesting research yeah. question yeah. but it, it is I, th I, I think it's, it's, it's something worth pursuing whether it's whether it's through research or whether indeed it's um, it's if you're working in the field of, of advocacy uh, yeah. it's I think it's an interesting Interesting question. What is what is, you know what yeah. what is it and and also who is it who is um, mm -hmm. what what are the what are the social origins as well as geographical origins of those who are yeah. investing? I mentioned this study, for example, that uh, looks at the immediate rather than sort of local transporter mm -hmm. investment, where uh, language and ethnicity is one of the advantages yeah. that, the, that, that the Chinese nationals bring with them, mm -hmm. uh, in along with the capital mm -hmm. uh, and technical know-how and markets that they uh, that they bring. Uh, but the, but they, there were also sort of systemic questions that I think right. were also really, really very interesting. Right. Which NGO are you working with? Um, Oxfam. Oxfam, right. Actually, I actually met you at the MRG workshop. Yes, yeah, 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 I thought that was that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Then may I ask one more? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please do. Uh, I wonder whether you are also researching on the banana mud migration to Myanmar from Laos because right now Laos put a ban on on new banana plantations and yeah. when I was in uh, Kachin states I realized now a lot of Chinese uh, investors are moving from Bogel in Laos mm -hmm. to um, to Kachin in, in Myanmar but then the, the issue immediately changed after it moved to Myanmar when, once it comes to land because in Laos as you said it's mainly in the form of land lease, yes. um, uh, uh, the most impact is health and uh, and environmental. But but in northern Myanmar, because in Kachin of the armed forests, a lot of lands was grabbed, for example, by military in those um, um, uh, the, the, the military controlled towns or by the armed group. And, and it means it became a, a more serious uh, issue involving Land grabbing. So I just wonder whether you are looking into this new trend. Um, I'm, I'm not directly, uh, directly my, myself, and, and of course, work in Kachin State is extremely difficult. It's more or less off limits to, uh, to uh, for any kind of research, certainly by uh, by my foreign research researchers. Uh, but I think one of the questions behind that that might be interesting to look at is, uh, well, first of all, there's been multiple pronouncements in Laos uh, that banana cultivation is going to be banned and every year as well as next year or next year or next year and, uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy the investments are uh, uh, multi-year investments and so sometimes the ban becomes well, well we won't allow any new investments to occur rather than we will rather than we'll cut down the existing uh, banana pl uh, plantations. Uh, but the other uh, question behind that is whether the, this migration is, is simply because of the regulatory uh, measure for ban investments or whether it's also uh, ecological because banana oh, cultivation yeah. has, a, it, it has a shelf life. Yeah. And one, one of the huge concerns that is mentioned also in that study that I, that I, that I talked about 
one of the huge concerns is that when farmers do these deals, brokered often by local authorities or local village uh, leaders, there's nothing in the contract that mentions the return of land to those farmers, even though they continue to hold the, the land, that mentions return of the land in its original condition. The poisons that are put on the land, uh, the chemicals that are put on the land, mean that it's highly unlikely they're going to be able to go back to the original cultivation. Sometimes they won't. Do, uh, sometimes it's difficult for farmers even to know where their original land was because the like, entire landscape is, yeah. if you saw from that picture, is re remodeled. The, the 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 buns that define the uh, the boundaries are all uh, are all uh, are all gone. Uh, but the but the question is: Is this simply uh, a kind of uh, sort of pioneering uh, 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 form of? Agriculture, where the uh, the land is mined for bananas until a disease comes <laughs> along, and, and then, they, then they move on to yeah. uh, to fresh pastures, uh, or or is it because of the regulatory measures, or is, or is it a bit of bit of both? Mm. And I, think, I think you probably find a bit, you probably find a bit of both. It'd be interesting also to look at whether it's the same investors going from Laos mm. to it is, I, I it is. okay. <laughs> so you find yeah. okay, so, yeah. so you can answer, answer this. Are you, do, do you work? I mean, in, in Oxfam, do you do you work with academic researchers following these issues? Yeah, we make, we usually cooperate with mm. uh, national local researchers mm. like National University of Laos, mm. uh, La, La mm. um, And what about what about in uh, in Myanmar? In Myanmar, less because mm. we found the academic landscape is a little bit yes, yeah. different. We mainly work uh, with national. Uh, civil society organizations, but also land group, uh, which yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but, but we realized that the research evidence-based advocacy yeah. is uh, less com in Myanmar compared with uh, yeah. other countries, and, and we are very interested in yeah. developing that. We should follow, follow this up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, thank you for uh, a very interesting talk. Uh, so I'm, I'm a China person. So Urban China, so I don't know much about agri agrarian studies, North Southeast Asia. So forgive me if my question sounds uh, stupid. Uh, so one question, is especially when you mentioned about in the nineties, uh, eighties, nineties, when the only role uh, <coughs> governance of uh, side of thinking kicked in, uh, land grab, defined whatever large scale, small scale. To what degree do you think that it's actually a different way to land in relation the land in relation to capitalism, capitalist productions? In comparison, let's say in the industrial times, I'm thinking about the movement of enclosure mm -hmm. in England, which basically, at least on the larger historical, usual narr historical narrative, basically kicked off uh, capitalist development, mm -hmm. so kind of Western society. So. Are these two in what ways they're similar, in what way they differ, and how does the differences and similarities that will may or may not influence the way we think about land as capital? Mm. Uh, since you gave two examples, uh, one is the fictitious uh, capital, land as the uh, debt capital, I'm again thinking about in a context, again, in a China context, which I know a little bit more, a um, lot of land grab happens as uh, land was turning into, for example, residential houses. That's a very typical way of how urban uh, expansion uh, happened. And also land turned into infrastructural spaces. Then of course, then there are the more uh, near ways of uh, taking over the management uh, right of land and then turn it into a large industrial agricultural production space. So for different uses, of the land that being converted into, does it also influence the way how we think about land as capital? Mm -hmm. Or is there overarching framework that we still more helpful than capital as a way to think about land? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting set of questions, actually. Uh, I, I mean, in terms of the, the enclosure uh, movement, there's certainly a lot of resonance in and I, and I don't think it's a coincidence that if there's a lot of residents in the early 1990s between the <laughs> enclosures of uh, and the you know the Highland clearances in Scotland and the enclosures of uh, of uh, uh, 17th, 18th century 
England and what was going on in, in Thailand in particular. I mean, in Thailand in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you saw, first of all, the, uh, the rapid rise of the environmental movement, and at the same time, uh, the emergence within social science in, 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 in Thailand of an interest in the commons uh, and, and what was happening to the, uh, to the, uh, to the commons in, in Chiang Mai, where, where I'm currently based, there's a number of academics who've done a lot of work on community forestry, uh, for, for example. And their, their main concern uh, was the, I guess, not so much focusing on capital, but fo focusing on the state uh, as, uh, and one of, one of the uh, key conceptual themes was a theme of territorialization by the state, uh, the, the, the inclination by the state to enclose by uh, territorializing, and only recognizing either fully private or fully state forms of, of tenure, rather than to recognize various forms of common property. Um, this wasn't only in Thailand, there was also, a, a, I guess, a, global, a sort of global interest in uh, emerging in the 1980s, 1990s in, in common property. And, and one of the reasons, I mean, one of the, I guess, sort of seminal article uh, against which uh, they were reacting was Garrett Hardin's article, The Tragedy of the Commons, um, which was uh, essentially suggesting that unless land is held entirely privately or under a very strictly regulated state regime, then resources are going to be are going to be uh, squandered and, 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 and plundered. Uh, and the response uh, against this was by this emergence of interest in in, uh, in common property in Thailand. This took the form of uh, an interest in in forest areas in particular, the commu community. Uh, uh, forest movement, but also associated with it was a kind of uh, anti-privatization, anti-titling uh, sentiment or concern uh, that fully privatizing, uh, fully converting uh, tenure systems to fully alienable, mortgageable land was going to result in the poor losing their land uh, to the uh, to the wealthy through distress sales and uh, and so on. So it wasn't just about Common property. It wasn't just about the commons. It was also about the uh, the concern of uh, the, I suppose, the sort of nature of capitalist and market processes uh, to concentrate uh, resources, including land, in the hands of those who can use their market power to uh, get them against against the interests of the uh, of the uh, of the poor. Um, the, I guess the second part of the question, as I understood it, was about the uh, about the, about well about capital and about what what is seen as legitimate and, and less legitimate. And again, it's, I'm, I'm sort of using the framework of this, this powers of approach because legitimacy is is a significant part of the uh, the debate on what is and isn't appropriate in the in the uh, sort of restructured management of land. I'm not familiar with China so much as Vietnam, and in Vietnam, one of the I guess one of these sort of cognate processes or some similar processes uh, to what you're describing is the uh, role of the uh, state and the legal system in deciding what land can be confiscated from smallholders and what can't, and under, under, under what conditions. And both at a sort of legal and political level, but also I think we can see at what I call a, a sort of moral level in terms of what's seen as legitimate or, or not legitimate in, in Vietnam, is a whole question of public and private interest in such conversion. And I would guess that in China this is also, uh, not, 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 a, not a, I mean, in, in, in Vietnam the form it takes is, is where, is particularly uh, where land on the urban fringes or the, in the very densely populated, populated delta areas is confiscated in the name of the public interest. And in some cases, it's very clear you need to drive a highway through uh, somewhere. And even then, it's very, very difficult. There are, there are uh, often protests, and uh, the protests usually revolve around compensation uh, because it's, it's difficult to argue against a, a highway as being in the, in the public interest. The, the question is simply whether the, uh, those who are losing land are, are being adequately compensated uh, against the market price of land and their, therefore their ability to go and buy land some, uh, somewhere else. Uh, but much less uh, straightforward is when land is uh, uh, 
uh, where, where land is confiscated for the development, for example, of industrial estates, uh, for private uh, investment, the foreign investment, or even domestic uh, industrial investment, or, or, or indeed residential estates, and whether that also constitutes a public interest. And, and there you have the development interest, which is the, the one that's usually brought to bear. And that's where a lot of the, con the, con the conflict uh, is. One, one, of the, one of the most um, dramatic recent land conflicts in Vietnam, at a uh, place called Dong, Dong Tan, just south of Hanoi, uh, last year, was when uh, the villagers who had lost their land took 38 uh, local police and government officials hostage for a period of time, demanding that uh, the uh, mayor of Hanoi come to negotiate uh, with mm -hmm. them. And what had triggered that was that the uh, originally the army had uh, confiscated the land uh, for the development of a new airfield in, uh, in the name of defense interests. It was difficult to argue against that as, as a public interest, partly because it was the army, you don't argue with the army, but partly because that you know, then, then it was simply a question of negotiating compensation. But in the end, the army did, you didn't use it for that. They sold the land to uh, a telecommunications uh, com uh, company uh, and for you know a blatantly private uh, a private benefit and um, and benefited both the, uh, both uh, for the state coffers, but also for uh, to my understanding for the. Uh, the private be the private wealth accumulation of certain army personnel, and this is what really offended the uh, uh, the, the villagers, and not only offended the villagers, uh, but also it just became a, a a national issue on social media in in, in Vietnam because of the the sympathies of, of the Vietnamese public were with the villagers because of of this way in which the so-called public interest had been used to. Uh, Enrich uh, a, a, a number of already wealthy, wealthier private actors at the expense of the uh, the poorer, poorer farmers. So this is where the public and private interest uh, issues are. But you say in China that's not really such a such a question. No. My impression is uh, in China there's there's no room for debate what is private and what is no. public. <laughs> Therefore, it's always yeah. in the name of public. What? Uh, actually, more accurately to say, national development is not exactly public and private. It's more national. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um But since there's no room for debate, sometimes I doubt whether we can really use it and talk about it as uh, analytically, as analytical frameworks that can help us to understand what is happening on the ground. Mm. Um, maybe that will be a different sort of conceptual, well, not necessarily conceptual, but at least the the significance of. Uh, the important uh, analytics are not mm. exactly on the private and public. So in China, in China what, what triggers moral outrage at land confiscation? Let's think, what is the big one? Sorry, throwing, throwing <laughs> questions back at you now. <laughs> I think we have to do it. That's yeah. a lot of answers anyway, so. Yeah, if you want to get off the hook, <laughs> <laughs> we have to leave that. We have to let the room for the oh, next. Oh, okay, uh, right. Okay. 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 So, if, so if, you, if you want to get off the hook, I'll let you off the hook by saying we're out of time. So for the most, the, the, I mean, the ones that's most controversial is again the the, the amount of conversation. Uh, True. If True. not, True. then no. But most of the time, I still see uh, the room for negotiation remains relatively uh, quite limited. Yeah. With that, I'd like to thank Professor Hirsch.